to see everyone out this morning so that we're able to worship God together in spirit and in truth. If you're a guest or a visitor, we hope you find our worship service encouraging, loving atmosphere, and one that you would like to frequent whenever you have the opportunity. It's good to see those that are here that are under the weather, that are back out among us this morning, and hopefully we all came to worship God in spirit and in truth, came hungry to do His will and to serve Him. Division is one of those things we've just come to accept in our society, wouldn't you say? It's almost as if when you think about the everyday division in the world, you can have whatever political view you want. You can be a Republican, or if that doesn't suit you, maybe a Democrat, or maybe even an Independent. In our consumer-based society, there are different avenues that you can go as far as your service. AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, and when it comes to sports, everybody pretty much has their pick. But if we're not careful, we'll take this same spirit of consumerism and infiltrate it into our religion and say, you know, I can have things any way I want. God really doesn't care about unity. God really doesn't care if we re agree religiously. In Mark 3, 24, Jesus says, if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house be divided against itself, that house, it just simply cannot stand. God has never been pleased with religious division and He's not pleased with it when He sees it today. Amen. So Frank read from us, for us from John 17. In John 17, Jesus prays for His disciples. In the first part of John 17, Jesus prays for Himself. He knows He's in the shadow of the cross. He has the sins of the world on His shoulders and He offers up prayer to God for Himself. The next thing Jesus prays for is for His disciples, the eleven, the apostles, that they would go out and accomplish the task which He set for them but then in the last place, Jesus prays for us. For those that didn't see Him face to face, for those that would only believe based on the testimony of those apostles. So in verse 20, Jesus says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also shall believe on Me through their word, that they all might be one. As you, Father, are in Me, and I in You, that they also may be one in us, that the world might believe that You've sent Me. Today, people see the denominational nature of Christianity as it's often shown in the world, and you can pick any church you want. You know, how do, you, how do I become a Christian? You can obey any plan of salvation that you want. In what way should I worship God? It really doesn't matter. But in John 17, Jesus prays that we might all be united, and he doesn't just say unity in whatever way suits you. He says, I want you to be one in the same way that me and the Father are one. You see, Jesus still isn't pleased with religious division, and I'm not sure if our friends and neighbors know this, but there's not a lot in this world that you may accomplish, but there's one thing that you can do. You can be the answer to Jesus' prayer if you simply unite religiously. Was Jesus praying for something that was impossible? We all come from different educational backgrounds. We have different frames of reference as far as life relates. Can we really be united religiously? Or was Jesus offering up, up prayer for something that just simply can never happen? Turn your Bible to the book of Ephesians. That's where our lesson will come from this morning, the book of Ephesians. And I want you to notice some things that Paul says here. So in the book of Ephesians, it's a two-part epistle. Paul breaks this up between doctrine and then the practical side. So the first three chapters in the book of Ephesians, Paul deals with a lot of doctrinal beliefs. He deals with heavy things. And then the last part, chapters 4 through 6, he deals with everyday life and how do you put those things into practice that you believe. So in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, Paul starts talking about the blessings that we have in Christ. And blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. Paul says, you Christians, when you obey the gospel, you get all spiritual blessings from God who before the foundation of the world chose us that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That's what Paul says in verses 3 and 4. And then in chapter 2, Paul changes thoughts. And in chapter 2, verse 1, he talks about our sinful state. And you has he made alive, or you has he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which way you walked in time past, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Paul says you were a sinner. You were heading to hell for your disobedience to God. But in verse 8, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Because God is before ordained that we should walk in them. And then in chapter 3, Paul makes this argument about the revelation of God. So how's God going to save Jew and Gentile? In chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, Paul says, by revelation, God made known to us the mystery as I wrote afore in a few words. 
whereby when you read, you might understand my knowledge in the mystery. So Paul, why do you say all of these things? The first three chapters, Paul deals with heavy stuff. Ephesians is called the richest book in the New Testament. You have all spiritual blessings in Christ. Chapter 2, you were a sinner, but God has saved you by grace. Chapter 3, God has revealed this plan to humanity so that you might know that Jew and Gentile can exist together. There can be unity in Christianity. But what does this look like in everyday life? What does my unity look like? How can I really be unified? How can I be the answer to the prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17? In Ephesians chapter 4, the first six verses, and that's where the lesson will come from this morning, Paul gives you the answer to the question. Paul lays down basically two arguments Paul has, and we'll break it up into three, but Paul really has just two arguments. And he says if you want to be unified religiously, you need two things, and you can't compromise on either one. Paul says you need the right behavior, and then in the second place, you need the right belief. There are those in religion that say, if we just love one another, if we have the right behavior, if we just treat everybody nice, don't worry about doctrine, belief, don't worry about the specifics. Paul would say, no, you need the right beliefs. If you don't believe the truth, you can't be unified. But sometimes there are those that believe all of the right things, they have all of the Bible, the book, chapter, and verse, but they don't behave properly. And Paul says, if you don't love and treat people right, you can't have unity in that way either. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness and longsuffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Paul, how do we get unity? Number one, Paul says, I want you to walk worthy. So Ephesians 4 and verse 1, Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, I beseech you, I beg you, I implore you, Paul says, I want you to walk worthy of the calling that's called you. The first step in unity is, I have to walk worthy. Take everything that Paul says in the first three chapters. You have all spiritual blessings in Christ. You were a sinner, chapter 2, verse 1. God saved you by grace. God's revealed the plan to bring Jew and Gentile together so that you might know you can have eternal life. Paul says, since all of these things are true as the prisoner of the Lord, I'm begging and urging you to walk worthy of the call. Paul says, walk like you know that you weren't supposed to go to heaven, but now God's making a way for you. This will help you to be unified. Paul says the way that you live ought to be reflective of the grace that's been administered to you. There ought to be noticeable change in our lives based on the fact that God has called us. If you read from the old King James in verse 1, you see vocation. Paul is just saying you're calling. And what's called humanity? Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and look at verse 14. 2 Thessalonians 2 and look at verse 14. Paul talks about our calling and he says, Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. God calls men with the gospel. He draws them in with that gospel. And once you obey it, it's just the natural response that a person would walk worthy of that high calling. If you were pardoned from death row for murder, if you got a speeding ticket thrown out, if you had a large sum of debt forgiven, what would you expect the response of that forgiven or pardoned individual to be? How do you respond when you've offended the holy God of heaven, but in his love and kindness he washes that away as you obey him? Paul says it ought to be demonstrated in responsible behavior that manifests itself in gratitude. You see, when a person's doctrinally informed, when you learn the truth, that's the only thing that can produce proper behavior. You see a person living out worldly, they don't change the way that they live in view of all that God has done, they just don't understand all that God has done for them. Paul lays that out in the first three chapters, so when you get to chapter 4, he says, now that you know all of these things, your life should change. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, and look at what Paul says there about the walk that we need to walk and how it needs to be one that's worthy of God. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Paul says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Paul says, Walk as if you know who's redeemed you and live the worthy life. We shouldn't live like the rest of the world because of the calling that we receive. 
If we want spiritual unity, it's going to start with our behavior and the way that we walk and demonstrating this faith toward others that do not believe. There needs to be noticeable change in our lives. As a Christian, you have the highest calling in the world. Jesus is giving you marching orders to be salt and to be light. And as a result, we need to live as if we are his heavenly representatives. But Paul goes a step further. In verses 2 and 3, he talks about behavior that will unify. Look at verses 2 and 3. He says, he beseeches you to walk worthy with all lowliness and meekness and long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Paul says, do it with lowliness and do it with humility. In religion and congregation, sometimes unity is stifled. There's an issue with unity because somebody's not being lowly. Somebody's not being humble. Somebody's making it all about me. Somebody's thinking more of themselves than they really should. And nobody's going to want to be unified with a person that thinks too much of themselves. I was reading a newspaper from 1985, and there was a story about Don Shula, famous NFL football coach, Miami Dolphins, won a few Super Bowls. In fact, the 1972 Miami Dolphins are the only team in the history of the NFL to ever go undefeated all the way to the championship and win it. Shula's a Hall of Fame coach. In 1985, he went with his wife to Maine on vacation, and they figured they'd go to the movies and have some downtime. Upon entrance into the theater, everybody stood up, applauded Mr. Shula and his wife, and cheered. Shula nudges his wife and he says, See, honey, I'm famous. They know me all the way out here in Maine. And one boy was going down to get popcorn and use the restroom, and Shula bumps him and says, Son, aren't you a Dolphins fan? He looks at Shula and says, Listen, sir, I don't know what you're talking about. There are only eight people in this theater, and the owner said he doesn't start a movie unless ten people show up. You and your wife are nine and ten, and that's why, that's why we cheer for you. Shula said, see, I learned a lesson in humility. Paul says if you want unity, you have to walk with all lowliness and meekness and long-suffering. Look at Philippians chapter 2, and look what Paul says about lowliness and humility. And how it ought to be characteristic of us all. It's going to be hard to be unified with a person that thinks because they may have a special talent, a special gift, a special ability that they're better than others. Philippians 2 and verse 3, Paul says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Paul says, You need to have a humble disposition. Because it's really not about you. If we want re religious unity, it's going to come when we're lowly, when we're humble, when we're who God wants us to be. In Matthew 11, verse 29, it says of Jesus, He is meek and what? He's lowly in heart. And if you come and learn of Him, you'll find rest unto your souls. The only man that ever lived that had anything to boast about, who didn't have to credit anybody with his existence, the only one that could ever beat their chest and say, fall down and worship me, Matthew describes Jesus as being meek and lowly in heart. You want religious unity, Paul says, with all humility and meekness. And then he says, I want you to be long-suffering. We need to be patient, people, if we're going to have the right behavior that unifies. Look at Matthew 18 and look at verse 21. Peter poses this question to Jesus about forgiveness, but it's really about patience. How long do I have to put up with somebody? How long do I have to be long-suffering with individuals? So in Matthew 18 and verse 21, Peter says to Jesus, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? The Jewish rabbis and the Pharisees felt that you forgive a man two, maybe, maybe three times, Peter throws out seven as if he's really gone over the hill. Jesus, how long do I have to be long-suffering with this brother that sins and he just keeps wanting forgiveness up to seven times? And Jesus says, I say unto you, not until seven times, but up until 70 times seven. Jesus doesn't say what he says in verse 22 to make us mathematicians. Some of us have done the math, and if you get to 491, right? Jesus says 70 times seven. Too many husbands and wives are trying to count to 490. Too many brethren are trying to count up to 490. And if you, if you get past this, well, I just can't forgive you anymore. You can't keep forgiving him or her. Paul says if you want religious unity, it'll be as you're long-suffering. In Ephesians chapter 4, at the end of the chapter in verse 32, Paul says, I want you to be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Why did God forgive your sins? Because you were good enough? Because you deserved it? 
He says it's because of what God did in Christ. It's on Christ's behalf that we appeal for forgiveness. So when we interact and deal with others, it's a natural response. Your behavior should be that which is long-suffering. Then he says, I want you to do this in love. People ought to leave our assembly and a husband ought to nudge his wife and say, Honey, you know, I think those are the most loving people we've ever been around. Those are the most friendly Christians I've ever met. Paul says, I want you to do this and I want you to have a loving spirit about it. People ought to know us more for our love than they know us for our desire to be right, for our desire to prove them wrong. You see, if we have all of the right beliefs doctrinally, if we believe all of the right things, if we have book, chapter, and verse for everything that we believe, but we don't behave right, Paul says you can't have unity that way. Because Christianity isn't just made up of doctrine. It's also relational. And we'll get to the doctrinal side in a minute, but we need to realize that what Paul says here is, I want you to have unity, and it comes as your meek, the long-suffering, and I want you to do it in love. Look at the end of verse 3. Paul says, endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Some people think we need to go out and make religious unity. Have you seen those bumper stickers on the back? They say coexist. And they have all of the different religious symbols from the world. And listen, if you guys just got together, if you stopped trying to be right, and you Christians, if you would just get with the Muslims, and Muslims, if you get with the Hindus, you could really have what Jesus prayed for. You could have religious unity. And they think it's our design or it's our purpose to go out and make unity. But notice what Paul says. You endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That is, there's already religious unity in God the Father and in His Son. And it's our purpose. You just don't mess it up. He doesn't say you go out and establish religious unity. He says keep what already exists in God. When you believe what He says and behave the way that He tells you to, you already have unity. The Bible is clear that God wants us to be unified, and part of that is with our behavior. Walk a worthy walk. Be humble, do things in love, treat people the right way. But we can't stop there. There are those in Christendom that would say, Hiram, that's all you need for unity. And to demand that people believe a certain system of things, to demand that people obey a certain way, you just go too far. It doesn't matter. God doesn't care what you believe. God cares how you behave. But in verses 4 through 6, Paul's going to deal with belief as well because if we're, going to have, if we're going to have religious unity, we need the right behavior, but we also need the right belief. So look at verse 4. Paul says, There's one body and one spirit, even as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Verses 4 through 6 have been called the seven ones. There's seven of them there, and of each one, Paul says, there's only one. He doesn't argue about it. He says, listen, Behave the right way, one through three, four through six, he says, now you have to believe certain things. You get around religious people that don't believe the seven ones in Ephesians four through six, and that's when you're going to have real division. A man says there are 20,000 bodies, it doesn't matter. There's more than one Lord, don't really matter. There's more than one God. Paul says, wait a minute, these seven ones, you can't compromise on them and be pleasing to God. Let's split these ones up into two different categories. There's the heavenly aspect of these, and then there's the human aspect of these. So in verse 4, for each one, you have one representation of God. In verse 4, there's one spirit. In Acts 5.32, God gives the Holy Spirit to all that obey Him. Why does this matter? Paul says there are how many spirits? There's one Holy Spirit from God. This is important for this reason. If there's only one Holy Spirit, He doesn't make one group of people run around the building and act crazy and foam at the mouth. He doesn't make another group of people speak in, in uncomprehendable words. You can't even understand them and say that speaking in tongues. And then we say, why do you do that religiously? Well, listen, when you, whenever you don't know the answer to something religiously, people just say, you just blame the Holy Spirit, right? The Spirit made me do it. I don't know why I do that. Paul says, wait a minute. There's only one Holy Spirit. And He operates in everybody the same way. The Spirit's not going to make you do something and make me do something else. He's not going to make me roll on the ground and make you sit there at attention. Paul says if you want religious unity, you've got to believe the right things about the Holy Spirit. He doesn't teach one thing in this book to me and say, listen, you can believe anything you want on this hand. Paul says there's one Spirit. In verse 5, he says there's one Lord. People don't have a problem with this. You ask a religious person, who is the Lord? Jesus Christ. There's only one Lord where we get our religious authority. Look at Colossians chapter 3 and look at verse 17. Colossians 3 and look at verse 17. Paul says, finally, brethren, whatsoever you do, 
in word or in deed, you do all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks unto God and the Father by Him. Three times Paul says everything. He says, whatever you do, that's everything. And then he says, in word or in deed, that's everything again. And then he says, you do all, that's everything. Paul basically says, everything, everything, everything that you do, you do it in the name or by the authority of Jesus Christ. Why do we need to believe this to have religious unity? Because if Jesus says something religiously, he says it to everybody. It's not, that's just the way you guys look at those verses. There's only one master and one Lord that we get marching orders from. It's not, that's what my pastor taught him. Listen, that's just how we've always believed. There's only one religious master, and I have to bow to his will. Whatever I do, I need his permission and authority, and not any man. You don't even need my authority. You need to make sure that if you're going to practice something religiously, you can put your finger on the verse that says, this is why I do it, because there's only one Lord. Amen. And then in the heavenly aspect, in the last place, verse 6, he says, there's one God and Father who's above all, through all, and in you all. There's only one God that sent the marching orders. And as we get through this, I think you're going to be able to see the one God sent the one Son who sent the one Spirit to teach the apostles the one faith. And when you obey the one faith through the one baptism, you have the one hope of heaven. It just makes sense. How do you have religious unity? You need to believe these things. In the last places today, we're going to look at the human aspect. Paul says there is one body. Basically, Paul says there's only one church. Now, if you've never heard this before, this is kind of, this is shocking. How do you just say, you Church of Christ people, you just say, you think you're the only ones going to heaven, there's only one church. That's what Paul says. Look at Ephesians 4 and look at verse 4. Paul says there is one body. Somebody says, that doesn't say there's one church. That just says there's one body. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 in the same book and look at what Paul calls the body. Ephesians chapter 1 and look at verse 22. He says, and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Paul in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, he calls the body the church. And then in Ephesians 4, he says there is one body. How can I be in a different religious body? How many denominations is God pleased with? How many churches does Paul say there are if you want religious unity? Paul says there's only one. It doesn't really matter what the religious world says. You know, a lot of people worship this morning, and though sincere, though giving it their best shot, though really doing what they think is right, Paul says there's only one religious body that pleases God. There's only one church. And then he talks about the one hope. In Titus 1 and verse 2, Paul says, In hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before the world began. That one hope is the hope of heaven. Everybody that has that one hope is going to spend eternal life with God. The only people in the world that have the one hope are the people that are in the one body. The only people in the world that have the one hope of going to heaven are the people that Paul just described, and he says, you're in the one body. He says there's one faith. What does that mean? Sometimes faith is used in different ways in the New Testament. It may talk about your personal confidence in God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. Sometimes faith is used and is talking about the practice of true religion. Paul says there's only one faith. There's only one set of teaching in the New Testament and everybody has to believe the same thing about what it says. You can't say that's not what that verse means. Paul says there's only one faith. You can't take the verses on belief and say, well, you just take the verses on baptism and we just have different ways of looking at things. Paul says there's one united teaching that pleases God. And then in the last place in verse 5, Paul says there is one baptism. And it's the baptism that saves. If I say that I'm a Christian, I've never been baptized for the forgiveness of sins the way that Jesus says, Paul says, I'm wrong about that. There's only one baptism. And it's the one that puts a person into Christ. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 3 and look at verse 21. Peter describes baptism using Noah as an example of how his family was saved through the water. And in verse 21 he says, The light figure whereunto even baptism does also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. If you've never been baptized, how can you have a good conscience toward God? If you're not in the one body, the church that Jesus died for, but maybe I'm in another, I'm in this church over here, I have these beliefs. How can I have religious unity? How can I have the one hope if I don't believe the one faith? 
you walk up to somebody that believes in Jesus and you say, how many Jesus Christ are there? There's only one. How many churches are there? Well, it really doesn't matter what church. The same verses that would teach a person that there's only one Lord and one God in those same set of verses, Paul would argue, there's only one church. What must I do to be saved? Paul never says, you know, you just allow Jesus to enter into your heart. Paul would say there's one baptism. And the same set of verses that would suggest there's the hope of heaven, people believe in heaven. Paul would say those same verses teach there's only one way to get there, and that's through that one baptism. And in the end, he lists the one God who holds this whole system together. Can we have religious unity? Yes, we can. Jesus prayed that we all be one. The world's never going to believe in Christianity as long as we engage in civil war with each other, as long as there's all this division. He says, if you're one, the world might believe that God sent me. That's how you prove the truth of Christianity to the world. When you ride down the street and you see 20,000 different churches that teach different ways to be saved, different things about Jesus, that's a sign to the watching world. I don't want to believe in that. But you this morning, we this morning, have the power within ourselves. God's given it to you to be the answer to Jesus' prayer. You need the right behavior. You can't just have verses 4 through 6. I believe all of the seven ones, but I'm arrogant, I'm mean, I'm not patient with folks. Paul says you won't, that won't work. But you also can't have verses 1 through 3 and say, listen, I'm patient, I'm long-suffering, I walk worthy, I'm a good person. But I don't believe verses 4 through 6. Paul would argue you can't have unity that way. If you're not a Christian this morning according to what the New Testament teaches, if you're not in the one body, the church of Christ, the one you read about in the New Testament, why don't you allow us to study with you? You know, eternity is a long time to sit there and say, you know, I wish I would have asked that question when I went to the Church of Christ that day. That preacher said some things I never heard I didn't agree with. I wish I would have said, hey, let's study the Bible. Maybe you're a visitor today and you say, I want to study those things out. I've never heard that before. There's only one church. I need to be baptized to be saved. Maybe you studied these things and you want to respond in obedient faith. You can unite with God this morning. We talk about unity with men. You can unite with God if you simply submit to Him and do what He says for the reason that He says. If you're a Christian and you're straight and you want to be restored and you stand in need of the prayers of your brethren, you can do that also. But come now as together we stand and as we sing.